I think we may have a few more that might filter in uh, throughout, but that's okay. Um, First of all, um, yeah, welcome. Um, thanks for click is not working yet. Um, yeah, welcome and thanks for having us here today. I'm, I'm Julian Bull, uh, the project manager uh, for the cleanup. Uh, most people uh, will know me anyway or have met me before. Um, uh, in terms of the process today, um, you know, we'll run through a presentation of, uh, of, of where we've been, um, of the clean-up process and, and also what it looks like over the next six months. Um, we'll then uh, give uh, Enviro Pacific a bit of a chance to uh, present as well um, and then open up to some questions as well. And, and uh, we do have some media in the room today, so we do ask that any uh, community questions would come first and, and, and media questions to follow that. Um, but to start with, um, EPA acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and water which we live and work and depend. We pay our respect to our Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. So as I said, we'll start with a bit of a quick, quick recap. I will buzz through some of these um, as a, a lot of people will have fo followed this project uh, throughout. Um, but if there are any questions, yeah, keep them to the end um, and, and we can then go back over them at, the, at that point. So discovery of the site, in 2018, as most people are aware, uh, we attended the site uh, with Vicpol um, as part of one of their uh, operations. Um, they were of the understanding there was, there was chemical waste on the site, so we attended with those guys and, and we did locate 20 to 30 uh, burial sites across the property. After that, um, after Vicpol realised there was probably nothing in it for them in terms of criminal uh, investigation. They did hand it over to EPA uh, because of the waste that was located at that point. Um, in uh, December uh, 2019, EPA exercised its powers under the Environment Protection Act uh, to step in and conduct that clean up. And, and that was due to, uh, we did issue notices to the, to the duty holder of the site. Uh, and the duty holder uh, failed to meet those notices, so EPA decided due to the, uh, the risk to the community uh, and the environment that we'd need to step in and, and, and start that clean up process. Most of you probably are aware, but we haven't touched on this uh, greatly in the past. Um, there are a lot of links to Melbourne warehouses, Melbourne businesses as well. Um, that relate to what has happened out at this site. Um, some of that's been through the courts now and is open information, so that's why uh, we do have added it in today. Um, it has been a joint investigation, as I said, with Vicpol and, and WorkSafe. Um, 19 um, warehouses were found in Melbourne. A number of sites caught fire in Melbourne, those chemical fires that you all would have heard so much about. Well, there was 19 other warehouses that could have caught fire there as well. Um, all really related to what's occurred out here. Same waste types, you know, same source where it came from, um, you know, related to the duty holder, who white fr um, from the site out here, uh, a major waste processor in Melbourne that's been through the media as well, that I'm sure you can put that together, and also bikey gang relations as well for this site. So. Um, EPA and WorkSafe undertook the clean-ups of, of those warehouses and, and fire sites in Melbourne as well. Um, and as I said, some of that waste was destined for here and some of it did actually end up here as well. Interagency governance, this is something we've touched on right throughout the process and we've got some of um, our, uh, our partnering agencies in the room today. Um, but this hasn't just been an EPA-ran project um, you know, we have had involvement from, from a number of different stakeholders right throughout um, and, you know, their partnership and their involvement in this team is, has meant that we, um, you know, do have really good governance over the project, really good controls over the project with that engagement. Community engagement. So, um, most of you will have followed the progress. We've been uh, updating uh, right throughout right throughout the project through a number of different forums. Um, I know, you know, at the start, and rightly so, there was some real concern about what had gone on out there, um, you know, what knowledge was out in the public. 
Um, we have done our, our very best since that time to, to make sure that uh, you, the community, uh, get all the information as soon as we've got it uh, and we're giving that out in multiple different forums and, you know, what's not up here is, is a lot of us are here every week, doing the work every week and happy to have a, a chat uh, in the street about what's going on out there as well and hopefully that's been able to turn around that, that public perception around, you know, EPA, the contractors and, and how the clean-up's been going out the road. That first 12 months, so a lot of a lot of scrutiny probably over the first 12 months, and and uh, you know action not taking place. But that first 12 months is really critical in 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 a complex project like this. Without without this level of investigation, you can't start a clean up process. You can't do it safely. You know you don't know it's there. You can't put out a a a, a tender at all. So. You know, we did the groundwater installation and monitoring because that was really key to protecting the community, the environment. Um, you know, we did do some targeted excavation so we started to understand what we were actually dealing with out there. A lot of investigation work, a lot of mapping work, um, some upgrades on the site and, and uh, you know, also some uh, flora and fauna assessment uh, related to the site as well. That groundwater monitoring that I spoke about, that's continuing. You will see that in all of our community updates, we always touch on this. Um, you know, we started off with putting in three groundwater wells and, and collecting some other local wells um, around the area. Uh, we now have about 35 wells on the site. Uh, with maybe 15 more going in over the next month or so. That gives us a really good groundwater um, network on the site, um, targeting uh, perched uh, groundwater, some of that groundwater that's at shallow levels, um, down to the Perilla Sands Aquifer that sits at about 40 metres above the limestone, and then the regional aquifer as well that sits down 60 metres below that limestone, which really is the critical one to, you know, agriculture and the region. You know, and that's the one that is critical for protection and that's the one that, you know, we have been putting most of the time into and that's the one that we certainly have never seen any impacts and, and, and we know that, you know, none of this waste uh, has got down to that level, which is fantastic. Targeted excavations, as I just spoke about, we did target some of the sites. Um, we did find some nasties and we were able to start, uh, you know, building that scope. The flora and fauna assessment, so really critical part of it was working out, you know, what needed to be protected on the site. Um, you know, this site had already been damaged. This site is a fairly pristine site still, even after all the work that's taken place. You know, there's 80 to 90 per cent of this site is still unaffected. You know, it's still really dense bush. It's the same bush that's out the back in the little desert as well. Okay, so it was really critical for us to know, um, you know, what was there and what needed to be protected and build that into the, into the uh, clean up scope as well um, and make those recommendations and, and uh, make sure they're followed right throughout the project and we're able to do that. And then putting together that tender, that, that, that uh, procurement and that tender to go out to market, you know, really target the best of the best um, to actually put in for this work. Um, so that we knew we had, you know, the A graders out there with such a complex uh, project that we're dealing with. Um, we knew it was going to be long term. You know, we really had to have that level of expertise and, and that's where we're able to get to. So the clean up. Enviro Pacific was awarded the tender, so really competitive tender. Uh, I think we had 15 odd submissions um, from right across the country. Uh, you know, pro all all of your big players in, in the in the waste and, and construction game really got involved. So, uh, Enviro Pacific awarded the tender, uh, mobilised the site uh, first of March. Uh, lots of infrastructure, even at that very first point, lots of infrastructure landed there. With what ended up there you know, 12 months, uh, 24 months later, you know, you could double that, triple that compared to what we landed there in that, in that first, uh, first instance. The detailed investigation, so this was where we started to go across those sites, those 40 odd sites that had been identified to work out which ones actually had waste in them, 
what waste was in them and sort of estimate uh, what volumes of waste was in them as well. So could really start to work out a targeted plan for, uh, for the cleanup. And then the waste removal started. So, uh, uh, yep, I'm back. Uh, so waste removal, this is site one. I'll run through a few of the sites, all right? So uh, 32 of the 40 sites ended up with waste uh, in them. Um, some of those sites were, you know, as, as, as big as this group of chairs, might have been 10 metres by 10 metres. Um, some of the other waste uh, areas were as big as the football field outside. Okay, and it was probably just all about needs. You know, what waste was coming in that day, uh, what they needed to do, where they needed to put it, it was all based on need. So this is site one, up the front of the property, was targeted as one of our high risk areas and, and something we wanted to get into really early. Um, the sort of waste that we found in here, um, chemical waste, uh, medical waste, as you can see there, some syringes and vials. Um, there was areas underground that had caught fire in the past or had chemical reactions in the past. Um, yeah, IBCs, uh, seven different trenches in this one area and waste was really packed in there tightly. Um, so this was one of our areas that we targeted really early um, to make sure we were getting that, the, you know, the bulk of the waste out. Site two, um, again, this, uh, one, of our, one of our main areas right at the front of the property, lots of waste in there, very different in the way it was buried. You know, a lot deeper. It was down to, down to five metres rather than down to two metres. Packed in, crushed in. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, compromised containers actually in this area. So a lot of, a lot of contaminated soil had to come out of this area. Um, acetylene cylinders started to show up in this area as well, which we'll touch on uh, a little bit further on. Site 16. So site 16 was our last site that we got into. Um, a lot more complex than what we thought it was going to be. So uh, it had eight burial sites across, across one location um, and what we found is mixed in with all of it was friable asbestos. Um, so it had to be under friable asbestos conditions the whole time, under the hazmat conditions the whole time. We had to have asbestos hygienists in there. Um, you know, every bit of equipment that went in, every person that went in had to be, you know, fully decontaminated before they left that area. Um, so really slowed down the process in there. But also in there, acetylene cylinders, you know, liquid wastes. Uh, over here you can see that's actually a drum with an acetylene cylinder cut in half and then an asbestos slurry mixed into it. So... There's no real method in the madness with some of this stuff. Site 23, so this is the one we were saying is as big as a football field. Just a massive site and uh, probably one we weren't expecting to be so big, but once we started uncovering waste, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, 15,000 acetylene cylinders came out of this site. Um, which is a lot of acetylene cylinders. Uh, we had, we had 51,000 across the site. So, you know, to have 15,000 come out of one site probably shows the scale. Um, chemical waste, asbestos waste, again, a lot of, a lot of uh, contaminated soil coming out of this area as well. Site 24, so this is down the back of the property. This is probably our, our, our um, most east reaching site. Um, and a lot of these sites, they popped up earlier in the piece. So probably trying to hide things a little bit better, going to the back of the property, you know, digging big holes, trucking things down there. This site was just one big hole. So again, very different, like a landfill, big, deep hole, um, mixed waste, as you can see in the picture up here. You know, you've got uh, drums, acetylene cylinders, like a black tar covering a lot of it as well all mixed in together. Um, so the work that the contractors had to do to actually get this out um, and get it out safely, not knowing if one chemical was going to react with the other, you know, really slow, tedious work. Uh, excavators with, with grabs with rubber tips on them, grabbing one barrel at a time, one cylinder at a time, getting it out, and then having people on the ground, you know, triage that, 
that, that, that barrel, that, that cylinder as well. Site 32, um, some that would have seen pictures before would know about the, um, the compound area here. Um, so this is a little bit, probably where they were living when they were doing this work out there. You know, all spray painted in chemo, few cars around the area, under trees. Um, what we found is they actually put all of that right on top of a burial site. And when we opened the burial site, it started reacting and smoking and, you know, attempting to catch fire. They put stuff in there that shouldn't have been there. The whole time we were doing the clean up in this site, a chemist was stationed down there because of the waste, the, the nature of the waste that was in there. And these guys were just living on it. So it probably shows, you know, their knowledge of what they were actually dealing with and, and you know, what they were, the way they were actually dealing with it when it was out there as well. Um, this is right next to site one and it's pretty much joined into site one now. Um, a lot of waste again had to come out here. Um, you know, the sites, a lot of contaminated soil in this area as well. We did at one point have a, which you probably have seen in the Age article, we had a, a big black swamp of, of contaminated water, well that's now gone. You know, all that water's gone, but all the contaminated soil around that area has all been dug out as well and, and disposed of off-site or treated on-site as well. So from there, from, from all these waste sites I've just shown you, I've shown you five or six of, of the 32, the waste then comes out of the ground. It's then trucked to a triage tent that we had on-site uh, in the triage tent, we'd have chemists um, and, and uh, other people working in there to determine what the waste was, um, or decanning it from half-crushed containers into, into uh, you know, other drums or other IBCs as well. Um, and then we had a whole wall of, uh, of buns on the other side to make sure that any waste types were being separated that should be separated, uh, and then storing it there safely until we had enough to be able to be trucked off site to, to licensed facilities. So at the start, when we were dealing mostly in that liquid waste, you know, this was probably our most hazardous area, bringing a lot of different wastes into here, having guys working in 40 degree days in hazmat suits, so I can tell you isn't much fun. They'd walk out there at, at lunchtime and tip out their gum boots and literally tip them out. You know, there'd be a litre of sweat in their gum boots and they're working in there every single day. So. Um, you know, this was probably one of our most uh, actioned areas early, um, but then once we moved into the asbestos and the acetylene, um, you know, the, the liquid waste had been removed. Those licensed facilities I'm talking about, we always get questions about them, so um, there's licensed facilities all over Australia that can accept this type of waste, which is where this waste was meant to go to at the start. Um, so we've been sending it to those. So, uh, the store landfill can accept some of this stuff. Uh, we've also got Geocycle in Melbourne, Solve in Melbourne, um, Cleanaway's uh, Winfield um, uh, facility in South Australia as well has been able to accept a lot of the, the waste as well. So just, um, just pure numbers. So uh, for those that want to know, these 32 sites, 26 now have been have been backfilled with, with clean soil and been remediated, which is fantastic. And those other six, they'll be, they'll be completed within the month as well, which will be really good. Um, 1.7 million litres of liquid waste uh, disposed of off-site. Um, 13,500 tonnes of contaminated soil disposed of off-site. So those that uh, in the transport industry would know how, much, uh, how many uh, truck movements that would be. Um, seven and a half thousand tonnes of contaminated soil treated on site um, and I'll get to that uh, shortly around our treatment uh, and around 40,000 uh, um, cubic metres of contaminated soil encountered. A lot of wastewater treatment, again I'll touch on that uh, shortly as well and a lot of acetylene cylinders, 51,000 acetylene cylinders found out there as well which is a, uh, a massive number and I've, I've got a good, oh you can actually see that's a big storage pad of them there, and that's only part of it. So validation and remediation. Once the waste is out of the hole, the job's not done. 
as I said, contaminated soil. A lot of this has been compromised. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got sub, some co subcontractors working out there underneath uh, Enviro Pacific as well, environmental consultants. They're conducting uh, the sampling, uh, the validation to make sure that you know, these locations are fully cleaned up. Any contaminated soil is coming out of the ground um, and is being treated and disposed of and all of these sites are, are clean before they are backfilled with clean soil as well. Soil remediation, as I touched on, we realised we had a lot of contaminated soil, more than we probably encountered for. We didn't want to be filling up landfills with it and we certainly didn't want to be using taxpayer money to keep trucking it off site. So um, with, the, with, our, uh, with our, our partners, Enviro Pacific, we started the uh, soil remediation out there. Um, so the soil remediation was, was bioremediation and soil vapour extraction, um, adding nutrients into the soil, uh, putting a, a uh, vapour extraction unit into the soil, works really well under the black plastic in the heat. Um, and is able to really reduce the contaminants uh, within that soil back to a suitable level, you know, back to a level where it can be used, reused on site. Um, so we had pretty good success with it really. I think we probably had uh, 70 or 80 per cent of the bio piles uh, get reduced back to a suitable level signed off by our independent auditor to be reused on site. And then the other, the other um, say, 20, 30 per cent that we couldn't, um, that reduced from, say, a Category A level to go off-site down to a Cat C level. So a lot cheaper in disposal, a lot easier for disposal as well. Water treatment uh, quickly became an issue last year. Uh, as the farmers would know, it uh, didn't want to stop raining there for a while. Um, and for us, we had open excavations still with contamination in them, um, causing contamination water issues all over the site. So we uh, had to put a wastewater treatment plan in, we had to put a couple of lined dams in to start holding that water so we can, could continue the work and continue to clean out those holes and backfill those sites as well. Um, but again, something that we didn't, didn't, uh, didn't think about at the start of the project, you know, hit us pretty hard last year and we had to, uh, had to adjust and get this infrastructure on site. Uh, an evaporation dam was also installed. Anyone that drives past might have seen some of this happening, as you can see the road right there. Um, so evaporation dam uh, just before the start of summer um, to try and get some water in there and get it evaporated off as quick as possible, some of that contaminated water. Acetylene cylinders. So as I keep saying, um, these quickly became a big issue for us. Uh, we knew we had them in that initial investigation in uh, 2019, the third site we opened up had acetylene cylinders. So we knew we had them, we just didn't know the volume we were going to get. Uh, and we also didn't know uh, the issue with disposal of acetylene cylinders in Australia. So to start with, while we worked out those issues, um, constructed some large pads on the site. Uh, so as you can see, 51,000 cylinders uh, stored over two different pads on the site. Um, some of them coming out of the ground, you'll see here, uh, getting, getting plugged um, to make sure that there's no excess gas le leaking out of them. So again, the guys working in these conditions, getting these cylinders out, walking around with meters, PID meters to see if any were still off gassing, uh, any had that explosive risk. Um, and if they, if they did, they were, they were plugging them with this uh, expander foam. Um, that's that's the, one of the real issues with acetylene. Uh, acetylene is, is highly explosive. Um, the other issue with acetylene cylinders is because it is uh, highly explosive inside the cylinders, they've got a asbestos membrane uh, and acetone in them as well to stabilise them. So you've got two different contaminants in there. That acetone can leak out of the cylinders. You know, that acetone needs to come out of the cylinders before you dispose of them. Um, and obviously the asbestos issue there. 
So we started to conduct this investigation about how to get rid of all of these, all of these um, acetylene cylinders. Uh, we engaged with industry um, across Australia, you know, the big players in the, in the gas industry, BOC being one of the key ones there. Uh, and we did find there was an issue. There wasn't a disposal pathway within Australia. Uh, and a lot of these were being stockpiled, being stored at facilities across Australia, in paddocks next to their facilities. And some, some partnering agencies may have known about it, uh, may have made sure that you know, controls were in place around it, but it wasn't necessarily regulated you know, as a waste or as a fire risk. Um, the only pathway was disposal offshore. There are other countries that do have setups like this, this one over here, um, where you could ship this, these acetylene cylinders to at about $400 a cylinder. Okay, so you, you, the industry aren't, aren't going to be able to do that. Or they did do it, they did do it in small amounts, but they weren't going to be able to do that with, with all of the cylinders coming out of circula circulation. So after all of this work, we put together a tender uh, after our investigation and, and released that to the market to see if anyone had the uh, appetite to um, you know, take up an opportunity like this to start up a, an industry uh, within Australia. Enviro Pacific awarded uh, the tender. So again, really competitive uh, tender. Um, we, it, it was a fairly niche tender though. Uh, we probably didn't have as many submissions as we would have had for the cleanup. Um, but Enviro Pacific ended up, you know, providing the, um, the, the most viable uh, solution. And they also provided the best solution into the future, the best pathway into the future, a national solution. So they weren't just going to deal with our cylinders on the site, um, but they were open to providing that market solution. And they had engaged with, you know, the gas industries as well to make sure that, you know, if this facility is going to be set up, it's going to be provide jobs into the future. It's going to continue into the future. We're not going to run into this issue again where settling cylinders are going to end up somewhere else in 10 years. Uh, so the facility is set up in store. Um, so it is currently licensed to accept. Uh, over the past four weeks, 40,000 of the cylinders, so that's 60% now out of date because they've moved so many this week, but um, 40,000 of the cylinders are now installed. Um, by start of next week, all of the cylinders will be installed at the facility. That facility has been set up, licensed with engagement with council, EPA, FRV, WorkSafe. Everyone's been involved there again. All the controls are in place. This is a licensed facility, okay, with all controls in place. Um, by the end of the year, they're going to be able to start processing. They're going to have the heating unit there, the cutting shed there. As I said, it's a really complex process, uh, acetylene cylinders, um, because, yep, you've got to get the acetylene out of, out of them first. So degas them, acetylene out. Then you've got the acetone to deal with, which is a contaminant in itself, uh, which is soaked into the porous mass of the asbestos. So the only way to get that out is under heating conditions. You saw the heater on the, on the slide before. So this is a heating unit. Um, they connect these cylinders to the heating unit, uh, heat them up, and then they're vacu vacuum extracted, uh, the acetone out of those cylinders. So you're just less, left with a cylinder with asbestos in it. But just that process for that amount of cylinders there is, you know, 12 to 24 hours. So it's a slow process. Then post that, You've got a, it goes into a asbestos area, cutting shed, all under asbestos conditions, ends are cut off the cylinder, the asbestos um, mass is punched out of the mil middle of the cylinder, it's wrapped and disposed of the way it should be, uh, and the cylinder can then be recycled as scrap. So it is quite the process. What's next for the site? So there is still an active court case, as, as we have touched on a few times. Um, the, these are the details as they stand. These are fairly current. They're only updated last week. Um, so there are 24 charges um, that are currently um, 
on Graham White, who's the primary defendant. Uh, that's for the fires, the Tottenham fire, the Lemon Springs, the warehouses in Melbourne. Um, so of all of, the, of, all of those um, charges, um, we're hoping, you know, the maximum penalties of seven years in prison and, and $1.7 million, you know, will be enforced, but we've, you know, we've really got no say in that. Um, and for us, that's not enough, but it's a, it's a maximum. Um, WorkSafe also have their charges on, on Graham White as well. Directions hearing in August, um, but the real trial, it begins in Feb next year. Okay, and I think it's, it's scheduled for about 40 days. So it's going to be a long process for those involved. DMOB. So this is where we're at. This is where we are at the moment. All the waste has been removed from the ground. All the contaminated soil has been removed from the ground. So effectively, the risk posed is removed. It's mitigated. So it is gone. Uh, and, and that's something that you know, we certainly celebrated, we certainly hung our hat on. To be able to get all of that waste and that contaminated soil out of the ground, you know, without impacts uh, off-site to the community, to the environment, um, that was something that, you know, we're really proud of and, and we certainly, certainly celebrated. So we're into this demobilisation stage at the moment. Uh, a lot of infrastructure out there. Um, it's all being removed, sites being backfilled. Those last six sites being backfilled. That'll take place over the next, say, month or two. You'll continue to see the movement, see those, uh, see those uh, pieces of infrastructure leave the site, see the guys around town. Groundwater and soil monitoring and reporting. So over the next six months, this will keep occurring. So every couple of months, we'll have to come back out, do um, groundwater monitoring events, um, some soil monitoring. So you still will see at times people going into the site, doing some sampling, doing some monitoring. You know, this all feeds into, uh, into the environmental consultants' reports that go to the independent auditor. So this all needs to occur to, to close out the site, to say that the site is, is fully clean, fully remediated and, and ready for its next use. Independent auditor, as I've touched on a few times, we've engaged an independent auditor to oversee all of this. So they're independent to us, they're independent to the contractor, they're independent to the consultants. Okay, so they're the ones that sort of set the limitations. Everything that we've done, everything we've cleaned up, every level we've cleaned up to, you know, the soil remediation, all of those sort of things, they've had to go past the auditor to be cleared, to be saying, okay, at this site, at this sensitive location, you guys need to make sure that things are to this level to be safe for the future. So that's what we've continued to do. At the end of that, when he's comfortable, um, they'll provide us with a letter of suitability post the clean-up, an, an audit letter that says that the site's now cleaned up and it's suitable for uses X, Y and Z. And this is what I touch on here. So that's site end juice. So we don't have a massive say in this because the, the land still sits with the duty holder until it doesn't, until the courts decide it doesn't. Okay, but... EPA is working with council at the moment and DECA at the moment, engaging planning consultants um, to make sure that there's controls in place on this site into the future. So it's not just audit requirements, um, you know, it's not in the hands of the court, but there's also going to be some kind of level of planning control on the site as well around what activities can take place there into the future. We aim for it to be a pretty non-intrusive purpose. Um, for the future, like conservation, something like that. Uh, there won't be vegetation clearing, there won't be uh, construction of dwellings or excavation or anything like that. Those things will be pr prohibited. Because like we said, this site, you can see it in that picture, it's, it's still very dense bush. It's the same sort of bush that's off the back in the little desert and you know, I think it doesn't really open itself to a lot of these uses anyway. You know, vegetation clearing and, and farming probably doesn't really open itself up to those uses anyway. So we think putting controls in place and returning it to a natural environment is probably, uh, is probably going to be one of the best uh, solutions there. 
Before I go to questions, I will hand over to Luke from Enviro Pacific uh, to present from uh, the contractors. Um, yeah, what do I think? Thanks for that, Julian. I'm pleased that I can come and speak to you. I've seen some faces around town and stuff. I've moved up here with my family for a couple of years, which has been a really good experience. Um, we're getting towards the end, which is great for my team. Um, most of the guys have been up here for a couple of years uh, working on the project and sort of, yeah, it's been a, a long process. Um, I get a, a few of the stats from our team to actually complete the work. So we're well and truly over 100,000 project hours to get the work done. So we have a team at the moment of about 15 people, but at the peak of the project, we had up to 30 people on site every day. Um, there's been over 500 off-site movements with zero incidents. So one of the initial concerns with the work was the nature of the waste we were removing. The containers are significantly compromised. Um, anything that was compromised was decanted into a new container. And yet yeah, the transport of all that waste to the facilities has resulted in zero incidents, which is a great outcome. Um, we tracked all the trucks, good drivers, um, good contractors. So that was a really great outcome. We were able to engage multiple contracting companies from the Wimra. Um, the local hardware and things like that's really helped us out over the last couple of years. So that's been a really good outcome for the job. And then we've worked obviously with the, the multiple government agencies up here to, um, to deliver the work. So I guess as far as the waste containers goes, I think Julian mentioned the 1.7 million litres. So that was compromised of 977 IBCs. 2,651 drums, both steel and poly drums. Um, the nature of the waste, poly drums generally contain the uh, acids and bases that we were dealing with, and then the um, steel drums were generally hydrocarbon related products. There was 1,042 other containers which made up of uh, small pack um, medical waste, 40 litre drums, 20 litre carboys, and then obviously the, the 51,000 acetylene cylinders that we removed from the um, property. The soil management stats, as Julian mentioned, um, over 83,000 cubic metres of material removed. Um, so that's a total volume, not all contaminated. The site obviously had a, an overburden layer which isn't contaminated, so we removed that, tested it, and um, we were able to reuse all of that on site. So yeah, I think 40,000 contaminated and then yeah, double that, not contaminated. Um, taken over 5,000 soil samples um, for validation purposes on the site. Uh, tested for various contaminants of concern based on the waste that we pulled out of the ground. Um, the, as Julie mentioned too, the, the SVE technology for the um, treated soil and then the disposal of that contaminated soil with the last sort of disposal campaign specifically around asbestos contaminated material. Uh, the water treatment plant you can see there, the two dams, so we're continuing to treat some water. Uh, it's, we're still getting plenty of rain. Uh, the majority of those dams are now isolated, so everything that lands on the site stays where it is and we don't have any open excavations that are contaminated, so we don't have to treat that water. This is just a bit of an example of the process we went through to get the sites to, to a backfill stage. So this is site 24 that Julian showed um, before. Really difficult waste mass to deal with. Uh, interesting um, resins and things like that holding waste containers together. So the guys had to physically separate material. So there'd be a drum stuck to an IBC, which may have had a cylinder attached to it as well. So there was a, quite a bit of manual handling associated with that. Uh, so the first picture shows the waste. The second picture is how we left the excavation before we sampled it. So as you can see, it's extremely clean. There's no staining or anything like that. So the, then we get coffee, Tetra Tech, who's our consultant, to get in and sample that material. Once we get the okay from them and the auditor, we then go through the backfill stage. And that's basically the picture on the right, how their sites are left, um, backfilled back to the natural ground levels. It's the same process for site, 20, site 12. Um, quite a tricky site with acetylene cylinders on the left. You can see the excavator stepped off, um, picking out cylinders one by one for processing and testing. Each cylinder we had to test as we pulled it out of the ground to make sure we weren't getting any vapours from those containers as we pulled them out. 
and that site since been backfilled too. It was another one of the large sites on the property. The same thing with site 10. This is a smaller trench, um, so the scale varied significantly across the site, but it only contained acetylene cylinders as well, so it was the same process was followed to backfill. The challenges, um, unknown chemicals. So none of the containers were labelled. Uh, they're the, the colour of them, the smell of them, often gives away what they are. Um, the nature of the work, we can't smell or see the colour. We can see the colour, but we can't smell them because of the PPE we wear. So we use equipment to test the, um, the material within. Uh, we engaged Clean Away to do that work for us. So they had two specialist chemists on site five days a week with us. Um, the wet 2022 led to us um, mobilising the water treatment plant, which we talked about before. And then the high temperatures during summer uh, pretty, presented some pretty significant challenges. Uh, we had zero heat related incidents, which is a really good outcome. Uh, the guys all wear heat stress monitors and things like that. Uh, that particular photo, the guys are wearing BA, so working with supplied air to deal with some fumatoxin contaminant. And then the, the last sort of challenge we had was developing a process for the acetylene cylinders. So we went to market originally um, to, to to send the bottles to a facility. Um, they're the, the only options, or the, the options that we could find that were licensed were Germany and America. Um, the number of containers to get that amount of cylinders to Germany or America was a lot, and the costs associated with it, it's just, yeah, it's not a feasible option. So we've developed a disposal pathway install, which hopefully by the end of the year will be operational completely. And that's it for me. Thanks, Lukey. Uh, if you want to stay up here, we'll um, open up to questions. So I think we have another mic maybe as well. Nick might take that one around. Um, do we have any questions? Um, Harvey Champness from Horsham, previously Caniva. Um, a question about water quality monitoring. Um, I'm assuming your groundwater monitoring will continue past the six months to the end of the year. Would, would that be the case? Yeah, that's correct. So um, groundwater monitoring, we've got two more events this year to take place. Um, but as part of the order to recommendations, there will be a site management order placed onto the site. Um, so groundwater monitoring will then need to continue as part of that management order. So whoever's in charge of the property at that time, whether it still be EPA or it has ha been handed over to a, another owner, that'll be part of their commitment moving forward. Um, could you su suggest how many years that might occur for? I couldn't, but the auditor will uh, definitely specify that. So, um, look, audits that I've dealt with in the past could be anywhere from two years to five years. Right, OK. Uh, second question. Um, did any of your test wells go down to just above the aquitard? So there's a number of aquitards on the way down. Um, is there one in particular? Uh, so we've got an aquitard at, it can, can be anywhere from five to 15. There's another one at about 25. I do think there's one in the 30s maybe as well before the limestone confining layer. Uh, I'm talking about the main aquitard that, that's above the, well, the, above the main aquifer basically. So in the Perilla Sands aquifer, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yes, we do. We have targeted that aquifer as well. And that hasn't shown any contamination either at this point? Uh, no contamination in the, in the deep wells, no. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, this might be for the... Uh, um, yeah. um, why was the recycling for the uh, gas cylinders put in stall? Um, most country towns are looking for industry and it would have been ideal here in Caniva. You already had a few there to start with, but why was it installed and not somewhere else? The size of the property that was available, as well as the proximity to Melbourne, we can get there a lot quicker. Um, it, the, the sheds and things like that are already there, so we're just repurposing an existing building. Yep. 
Any other questions? Yeah, g'day, Gillian. Um, I've noticed all the way through you've never named the chemicals. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, g'day, Rob. Um, we have. We, we've so we could go through and name the chemicals individually. Um, they don't. We're not pulling drums out of the ground that has, um, you know, this is this, this is that. That's that's not the nature of what we've got. So um, we have pretty much gone through and detailed everything we've got. So we've got hydrocarbons, we've got pesticides, we've got solvents, we've got acids. Um, we've certainly gone through all of that and, and detailed all of that. Um, anyone that wants more than that information, we can certainly provide that. You know, we've said we've got PFAS contamination out there. It's probably, you know, one of the most taboo um, contaminants to talk about at the moment. We've certainly been open to say that we have had it out there. Um, so certainly nothing to hide. We've never, never had anything to hide. To run through a list of actual contaminants would be really difficult. A lot of these are mixed as well. So um, when they are going to these facilities, it's not necessarily you know one contaminant in one drum. A lot of it is I'm going to mix all of the types into that drum and dispose of it because I can take it all as a as a class three flammable offside or you know those sort of things. So that's probably the nature in in what we've dealt with. And again, we're not pulling a lot of full drums out of the ground. Uh, we're not pulling drums out of the ground that have stickers on them and things like that. Um, Luke might be able to answer some of that as well in terms of what other chemicals we've had out there. Yeah, the challenge with a lot of the chemical testing is too, it's not accurate. So, and because nothing's labelled, we can get stuff tested, but one, the labs don't want to run it through their equipment because it's neat. It basically destroys their gear. Um, so the, the process we used on site was a triage process that so we identify the classification of the waste. So the hydrocarbon waste, generally flammable. Um, so that the, the process around testing that was more around working out exactly the, the dangerous goods risk associated with transporting it to the right facility for disposal. Uh, your flammables and things like that, when they get to the facility for disposal, they're bulked up. Um, and that, that particular waste is treated in a way that um, they use it as a fuel source for cement kilns and things like that. So GeoCycle bulk the waste up, send it to a facility and dispose of it. Testing each container for what was in it, um, there's, there's no way we could have done it in Australia. It, I just, there's not a lab that would have been able to do it. Uh, a lot of it's really degraded too. Um, but there, in saying that too, there's other chemicals that we were pretty confident what they were because of the labelling on the containers. Uh, that some of the, the fumatoxin and things like that was actually still in its original containers. Um, but yeah, the, the drum-based wastes, very difficult to, to actually work out exactly what's in them. Yeah, that's right. Look, some of it, there is a paper trail too, and it forms some of the investigation, not only into into white. We've talked about other industries that have been involved and, and been in the courts of late as well. Um, but crooks being crooks, they find a way as well, Rob. Um, so some of it had a paper trail, some of it didn't. You know, some of it they were able to get around the system, um, you know, looking like waste was going in somewhere and it was going out the back door or looking like a certain volume was showing up um, where twice the volume was showing up. Um, so there's certainly a paper trail. Um, one thing I will say to that is um, since this has all occurred, uh, a, a new Environment Protection Act has come out, a new waste tracking system has come out as well. Um, and it's, it's to strengthen up these powers, strengthen up our ability to be able to track because no doubt there's certainly some shortcomings from, from our side of things as well. Um, other agencies would say the same thing. Uh, we've hopefully taken those learnings, been able to bolster up our strengths with our act now and with, with our waste tracking so that we don't have incidents like this again into the future. It's part of the audit as well. So uh, when you're removing waste from a site and getting an environmental audit over the site, um, they're going to ask for groundwater balls over the site. When they're installing these balls as well, they're taking soil samples on the way down. It's to close out a data loop. Uh, it's to make sure that we know everything. We have all the data that we are, need to make that audit decision. Um, 
the example I used on site today with some, with some media outlets is uh, if there was contamination in the groundwater directly below us into that regional aquifer, um, it's described as mo moving glacially. That's how slow it actually travels. So even though we might have sunk a bore 100 metres away, it might take five years to get that 100 metres. Okay, so it's about making sure we've got a sufficient coverage across the site, across the burial locations, so that the auditor can actually make that informed decision to say the site's cleaned up. Yeah, that's right, Rob. And we're sinking wells right next to where we had the waste and at different depths and, you know, we've removed that bulk contaminant, we've removed that source, we've removed that contaminated soil. So, you know, we are targeting these locations for that exact reason. We're not putting them 100 metres away. We're putting them right there. <clears throat> yep, any other, any more, Rob? Thank you. Yeah, I've got one. Um, what guarantee have you got that there's no other sites around, whether South Australia, Victoria, similar to this? Um, probably as much as a guarantee as we had that there wasn't this site 10 years ago. <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, um, we would hope that it would have come out. You know, we have had a lot of coverage. We've had some, some really negative coverage and we've had some fantastic coverage over the past 12 months as well. Um, you know, nationwide coverage. So I would hope that if if anyone else had seen things like this showing up, that it would have been reported through to us. Um, as you know, we don't have EPA officers stationed all over, all over Australia. Um, we do rely on intel from other, other departments like, like our VicPol, like our council, but we rely so much on community as well. You know, if, if things are happening in your backyard that don't quite look right, um, you know, if there's individuals that seem to be doing something that you think is uh, going to be affecting your, your environment or polluting your environment, then ring us, report it in. You know, you've got, we've got to have those eyes and ears out there as well. So um, am I comfortable that it's not happening somewhere else in Australia? No, I'm not. Um, but I think we're probably better placed to have informed the community now than we were three years ago. Yeah, I think a lot of the locals had a bit of a suspicion for some time, but we had no idea it was like that, like like it is. But the part that concerned me and a lot of others, the uh, the trucks that carted this stuff up from Melbourne, no doubt they wouldn't have had ASCAM signs on, and uh, for the first responders to crashes and things on the road, well, their lives are in danger, and I hope they bring that up when this fellow goes to, uh, through the court because uh, it was a serious thing and uh, it put a lot of lives at risk because it went through the middle of Ballarat, Ararat, Horsham and so on. Could have happened in the middle of the town. One of them things caught fire, it would be worse than your Footscray thing, I think. Yep, and totally agree with that. And it's certainly something that WorkSafe have considered very heavily uh, within their charges and their investigation as well. Um, you know, they are they are the agency in control of of those tr transport dangerous goods transport, um, and they've also bolstered up their abilities to be able to track that as well over this time and through these learnings. So, um, look, like I said before, unfortunately, crooks always find a way. Um, the waste game has notoriously involved crooks um, because they, they have found ways to get around it. Okay, hopefully we're all strengthening up in those areas that those loopholes are really starting to close in on them. <clears throat> uh, any more questions? Community? Sorry, what was that one? I missed that. No, no human remains. Um, some of the more interesting things we found. So we did find a very large dog la um, wrapped up in a mattress. Um, we found some clothing, um, a few IDs, uh, yeah, some, a little bit of cash, like I'm talking $15. Um, but no, we, we really didn't find anything exciting, did we? It was just a lot of waste.
Yep. Yep. So, just wondering, um, any ideas on how much it actually cost to clean up the site, and how much money do you think this guy actually made from the proceeds of crime? Yeah, and great question, the second one. Um, look, it's, it's tens of millions it's cost to clean up the site. Um, you know, we ha have set the store facility all comes into that as well to, to process and process into the future. But yeah, tens of, tens of millions of dollars to, to actually clean up, um, you know, which is, which is terrible for the tax payer. And we're certainly going to try and recoup any of those costs we can through the courts. Um, you know, we will take him for cost recovery, try and take any assets and things like that that are left after, after WorkSafe have their go as well. Um, in terms of the money made, um, we we're only having that conversation as well today. Uh, I would love to guess, but I wouldn't know because, um, you know, I, there was, uh, it was fairly highly sophisticated, undercutting the market um, in the waste game. Um, providing much cheaper uh, rates for disposal, um, you know, tied into one of the bit major industries in Melbourne. Um, so trying to work out uh, how much it's cost to clean up um, across all of the sites, the warehouses and all of all of the other clean up sites. Uh, I think we we're getting up um, up to 150 million odd today when we we're talking about cleaning up all of those sites. So uh, in terms of how much they made, um, yeah, it could be. Yeah, it wouldn't be that much, but it could be heading up that way. Now, the other question was, um, with the thinking about that proceeds of crime and thinking about, you know, the future use that you might have planned for it, um, and thinking in terms of the reputational damage to agriculture in this region, um, do you see any possible money coming back into this local community? Yeah, look, in terms of proceeds of crime and, co and cost recovery, um, so that money will all be tied up in, in the cleaning up of these sites. Um, in terms of actual uh, money into the community, hopefully that reputation risk in terms of agriculture has been mitigated now by you know not having those impacts not having those offside impacts not not impacting the aquifer um, you know again there's been some really positive media around that over the past six months as well uh, which has spoken to those those impacts or those uh, the mitigation of those impacts um, but again Luke might be able to address this better than I can but um, for three years now we've had multiple people living in the community, working in the community, you know, being part of the community, going to school. Um, you know, Luke's a, Luke's a, a local football umpire, um, spending money in the community as well. Um, so I hope, you know, in, in some way, um, there has been that level of uh, being able to put back into the local communities as well. I don't know if you want to touch on that one, Luke. Yeah, I guess from our point of view, we've had a bunch of people relocate for nearly three, by the time we finished, it'll be nearly three years. Um, I've recently moved home, it's hard to leave. I can see why people like it up here, it's a good spot. Um, I, my family's from Dimboola, so coming back up this way was a real positive for me. But yeah, we've, we've spent a lot of money in the community. Um, long term, I guess it depends what happens with that property. It's, yeah, that's a decision for the regulators and the government to decide. But yeah, we've definitely hopefully left a positive mark on the community up here and we've de definitely developed a lot of relationships with businesses and things like that that we'll be able to rely on in the future for other works because we do a lot of other different type of work too. It's not all doom and gloom cleanups. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely been a lot spent in the community. Yeah, thanks Luke. And, and, the, and the use of local contractors as well, isn't there? You know, um, being able to, uh, yeah, subcontractor, um, People out of Horsham, uh, out of Neil, out of uh, Harrow, yes. Yep, so there has been, um, yeah, those, those opportunities as well. Um, with the high risk nature of the site, a lot of those photos show, you know, explosions and whatnot under the ground. Did you have any serious incidents or, you know, it seems, 
crazy to think that there was that much risk involved and all the hazards with all that commingled waste and the flammable nature of it all. Did you have any serious accidents or how did you make sure that things didn't blow up? Yeah, no serious incidents on site, no serious injuries, uh, cut fingers, things like that. But yeah, the, the safety side of things was a real positive for the project. The guys in the suits are working under extreme, um, in pretty extreme conditions. The, the sweat that Julian talked about coming out of gum boots is real. Um, they got, we basically have them work short shifts in those suits, um, especially if they're under BA conditions, because you use a lot more tank air when you're, you're working in, in a hot environment. Um, the, we did have some things react as we pulled them out of the ground. So yeah, they, they were basically isolated We'd move away from them, let them do their reaction, then go back and check them uh, and then triage them from there. But that definitely did happen. It's just the nature of what we were dealing with. But, yeah, no significant incidents at all. It was a real positive. We want everyone to go home safe. So. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Um, Luke and Nick, I um, I called out and uh, had a tour of the site, um, say, six months ago, I think it was, and uh, was obviously part of this from the early phases. Um, it's remarkable what has been done out there. Uh, I wish all of you could have seen what I've seen and you would go, wow. Yeah, with all of the concerns that have been raised are valid and um, I'm hoping you're happy with Julian's answers on them, but... Uh, what the work that Enviro and EPA have done is outstanding. We got off to a little bit of a rocky start, but since Julian's had the helm, <laughs> hats off to you, mate. Um, it's been uh, travelling really smoothly, and I'm hoping that um, we've got a, a fresher idea on what's going on out there. I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Um, it's not ideal, uh, but we can't turn the clock, clock back on that one. So just wanted to thank you guys. And uh, have you got any thoughts about what we're going to use it for? I'm assuming it's not going to be a water park or a theme park or anything like that. No, thanks, Darren, and we uh, certainly appreciate your support throughout as well. Um, look, we, we are in, in talks with some conservation groups, um, so we have actually um, started uh, open dialogue with those guys. Um, again, we, it's not our land to hand over, um, so there's, there's a process involved. It involves the minister. Um, we wouldn't be handing land over to be, um, you know, still on sold with those controls and things like that. So, yeah, conservation groups are certainly involved. Um, traditional owners uh, have shown some interest as well. Um, so looking at those sort of uses, you know, those, those non-intrusive uses, not saying that people won't be on the site. You know, we want people to still go enjoy the site, enjoy it for what it is. Um, but, yeah, just certainly uh, no intrusive activities into the future. Any more questions from anyone? Opened up to everyone. No, all good. Well, um, look, from here, uh, we'll all be around for a bit. There's, there's uh, tea, coffee, biscuits up here. Uh, if anyone feels like they just want to have individual chat with, with any of us, really, any of uh, the contractor guys, any of the EPA guys, um, feel free to come up and have a have an informal chat. Um, we really appreciate you guys turning out as well. Um, look, the, the way I see it is, this is a real positive. Um, you know, our first community meeting, I'd say we had 100 angry people in the room, and rightly so. I would have been bloody angry if it was in my hometown as well. Um, and we've slowly been able to turn that around and, and provide that, I think, provide that level of comfort that you know, we do know what we're doing and we are, we are cleaning up in, in your best interest. So hopefully um, the numbers in the room show that and we've been able to um, satisfy your questions. But again, we're always around. Stop us in the street, send us an email, give us a phone call. We'll answer any questions anytime. So thank you very much all. Appreciate it.